Hello, salutations. Welcome to the, technically, the 11th episode of A Star Night Dwell. This episode with a special guest, friend of mine, and incredible mind, Katarina Pejovic, where we'll be discussing all matter of serpents, dragons, ophidian beings, uh, through the context of the constellation Draco, that old pole star, that old dragon, the ancient times before humans had dominion of the earth, that representative of all the old and, and archaic ways of this planet, as well as all of its great mysteries. Uh, I'm excited for this one. Kat is a brilliant, brilliant mind uh, and someone that I, whenever they speak, my ears perk up uh, and I'm always attentive. I would like to use this 11th episode as a marker of sorts, um, if not the very least, for a little introduction, which I've never done before a show, except for that one Mercury Retrograde episode that we did with Michaela Ann of Saturn Vox podcast. But that was for the sake of letting the listeners know about the various technical difficulties that we had, understandably so. This is of a different sort. I would like to point people to the various ways that they can support the continuation of the show. Acknowledging, as many of us know, that keeping a podcast going is a lot of work, especially if it's one person. And the best way to support the show is through the Patreon, which is at Star Night Dwell. The rest of my social media is also at Star Night Dwell. That's S T A R N I G H T D W E L L. You can find me and all sorts of wonderful bits about the show on those different at Star Night Dwell handles, as well as on my website, starnightdwell.com. But if you're interested in full episodes of the show, as well as various bits of uh, esoteric information, full writings, um, write-ups that I do on uh, specifically forecasts having to do with the lunar stellar firmament, the stars and the moon, as well as all kinds of bits on Islamic esotericism, the jinn, magic, art, all sorts of strange audio-visual concoctions that I have made, the Patreon is the best place to go. And for $7 a month, you can support the continuation of the show as well as um, support my work more broadly, my work as, as an artist, as a, as a creative, um, and uh, so many of the things that I've been working on, including new writings, new podcasts, as well as uh, polls and ways that the Patreon community inform, as well as inquiry this podcast and its uh, ongoing creation, co-creating with the podcast. So I wanted to add this little section before, which I've never done, um, to simply ask that if you enjoy the show or you have enjoyed this show, uh, a star or a like on Apple Podcasts or Spotify in particular is incredibly helpful. So give us a like, give us uh, a few stars, give us however many stars you feel that uh, we are worth. And um, thank you for your support, thank you for your listening, and uh, I hope to hear from you and see you on the Patreon. So now, I hope you enjoy this episode, this wonderful, wonderful episode with our guest, Katarina Pejovic, on this Star Night Duel. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of A Star Night Dwell. We are here with my friend Katarina Pejovic. Um, dragon, dragon lady, dragon girl, she is sometimes known. 
um, expert in <laughs> expert to expert in all things serpentine. Perfect for this episode that we have planned for you today, uh, which is more than just on the constellation Draco, just as as it goes with this show, our structuring mechanism where we are taking the images in the in the sky of the stars uh, and using them to talk about all sorts of things, magic, esotericism, art and and culture. And uh, for this one, I wanted to use the constellation Draco to get into serpent, dragon lore more broadly. What are what are some distinctions even between those things, how they do relate to the stars, a little bit about Draco, uh, and also just see where the conversation goes with um, with Katarina, who is just an incredible, incredibly knowledgeable person in regards to all this stuff. So how are you doing, Kat? Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to hang out with you and your absolute, you're, you're a wellspring of erudition and an absolutely wonderful uh companion through all of these wonderful starry seas so it means a lot i'm, do I'm doing great i'm excited to talk about this uh it, it is indeed known in some circles that i am a a bit of a nerd for the dragon and the serpentine related myths and stories i would say that um in my professional life i'm a phd candidate at the university of toronto i study saint cyprian and saint justina of antioch in various different uh forms and localities i look at their legends in terms of uh, how their hagiography and oral lore, where it crops up in the ethnographic vignettes that I look at, challenge and disturb notions of licit and illicit performances of ritual power. So what is a saintly intercession, a miracle through the divine and what is sorcery? And so of course, whenever you look at any kind of notions of magic and witchcraft serpents are going to be everywhere. And I am from Western Serbia. I grew up with a great deal of dragon lore. We're kind of known to have a great deal of different kinds of taxonomies of dragons and a fairly robust uh, area of stellar lore that comes with that. And it's one of those interesting things where while I am a scholar and somebody who is very much in the academic world, I grew up with a great amount of traditions that were very preserved orally within uh, the villages where my family comes from, and I've spent a lot of time studying anthropological, ethnographic, and ethnological materials out of Eastern Europe um, in various different languages that are spoken uh, in the South Slavic family group. And it's something that I've been very excited to share with people is that continually what I come up with, since I do present a lot on Balkan folk magic uh, as a as a you know eternal love and thing that I've been involved with and trained in over many uh, successive teachers, um, greatly indebted to the oral histories that so many elders in these villages have preserved. Uh, dragons are everywhere, you know, so it's it's inescapable. So as, as much as uh, fairies and the Vile and the Samovile are hugely influencing our star lore and our perceptions of relationships between people and the different worlds that we see the spirits as inhabiting, uh, I'm also, uh, you know, we cannot neglect the importance of the serpents, which is even the name serpent is used in so many Indo-European cultures as a cipher for stars themselves, which is no different for us. So this is, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. I love your podcast. Um, I love your mind. And I love taking your classes and listening to all the wonderful things you have to share uh, uh, and same. telling everyone that I know to please, please go listen to anything that Jay ever puts out. Uh, you know, he is absolutely uh, a force to be reckoned with and a real intellectual titan when it comes to any any of these subjects. You know, I could listen to you talk all day. So I, it's, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you so much. Well, I extend the same to you uh, thoroughly. And uh, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been wanting to talk to you about this stuff for a really, really long time. One of the things that, uh, and also thank you for introducing yourself, uh, even without me asking. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> you just you 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 know how you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I appreciate about you as a person, about your work, about spending time with you, is that you are one of the, as, as you mentioned, uh, and 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 you were humble about it as well. But you are one of the few people who, in in 
in this broader community of of magic occultism what have you at least in the anglosphere that you pull from so much more than just book book learnedness than than things you read in books right uh, most of the people in these scenes are are and getting their information from books for the most part. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but one of the joys in speaking with you is that you have so much experience uh, and, and wisdom coming from oral lore, coming from being actually spent time uh, and, and knowing the language and, and having the cultural connection and ancestral connection to uh, these paradigms that you're speaking about. So I, I just want to say thank you for, for the, the hard work that you've put into you know, studying so, th so many of these things so thoroughly, as well as being who you are. And, and it's just one more reason. It's like, gotta, gotta have Kat on to talk about these things. Thank you so much. I think that, um, especially studying St. Cyprian, who's kind of like a quintessential book saint, right, in the sense that he has literally, Olivo Gange de Cyprio, you know, he has this famous grimoire that he's associated so much in the oral legends, and it is its own oral presence. I have um, uh, an enormous amount of respect for the way that uh, you know, book transmissions uh, preserve so much, especially, you know, so when you look at Slavic and Thracian, Vincian, uh, Illyrian, Dacian cultures, uh, various aspects are not preserved very well because of a lack of, uh, you, know, you know, actual preservation by, um, you know, being written down. But at the same time, so much has survived. So I find that when people get excited about these things and want to learn how to act with them, they're a little disappointed when they come at it from a neo-pagan perspective of wanting to see the gods, you know, wanting to see very explicit mentions of certain categories of spirits. Whereas I can point to several um, villages where these practices are very much carried out. You still have animal sacrifice to various beings, uh, they, but they're called by saint names. You know, it's, it's, you don't, I've never heard somebody say this bull or this goat or this ram is to Beron. I've heard people say it's to Ilya, a, a Gromovnik, you know, it's to Elijah the Thunderer, the prophet Elijah, who is so thoroughly syncretized with this storm deity of order and, um, and fertility and all these other things. You know, I don't really hear people say this is to Yarilo. Um, the war deity and uh, of the summer and who's associated with the the heat and and the violence of iron piercing this world and fertilizing it and stirring up all these land serpents. Uh, I hear Saint George, you know, George of them. Saint George's Day on May sixth for the Serbian Orthodox calendar is. Uh, you know, books, entire books have been written about the importance of this day and all the rituals that go on in the um, you know Mount of Nobichai and the in the you know. Um, it's like the, the traditional ways, you know, the, the folk ways and so on. So I think it's it's worth noting that the way that I've learned a lot of this stuff is just by talking to people, um, cold calling some people at times, uh, going through various chains of who knows who <laughs> in various villages and asking them, well, how do you do it differently? And it's always different. Um, so some of the information that I'm sure we'll talk about today in terms of dragon uh, myths, you, you'll, there if for those uh uh, Balkaners listening to this, especially people from Serbia, uh, you and, and Montenegro and Croatia and, and Bosnia and Albania, uh, you might, and Macedonia, certainly Bulgaria, you might hear some of these things and be like, I've, I've never heard this before. Is this really true? Um, and some things that you, that, you know, you've absorbed in your cultures, I've probably never heard of either. But that's the beauty of oral lore. It isn't, uh, it's not that necessarily saying that, you know, this one village where they have this custom with this Nia that's the house serpent. So it's a, a house guardian serpent, uh, literally, I suppose. It's the, it's a kind of house spirit that is considered to be a serpentine ancestor. Um, that lives in the hearth, uh, the way that they tend to the spirit may be completely different from a village next over. Um, and by necessity, this has to be the place. And I think this is the beauty of oral lore because books have this capacity to canonize things. Uh, and I'm very sensitive to that as somebody who does anthropology and who studies religion professionally, is the potential to canonize things by doing ethnographies, which is, and ethnography is always more about you as the writer than it is about the people that you're studying uh, in many ways. And, and so, and, and the lens, uh, the interpretation that you bring to this context, um, the way that you choose to explain a culture, whether it's your own or another's. So it's something I'm very sensitive to. 
in the sense that I'm like, oh, uh, this could certainly have its own ramifications. Uh, people might see this as now official, uh, as this is the way it's done. And so when they encounter a different form, they might think, well, that wasn't in the book that I read. And that certainly wasn't in the book that got translated to English or that was written initially in English, which is the sort of privileged as the form of knowledge. But it's ultimately, as I've read a lot of, uh, you know, many, many works in Serbian and Slovenian, in uh, Bulgarian and so on about a lot of these things. And uh, I, I want to respect and honor the diversity because to, for something to be living as a tradition, to not be reconstructed necessarily, or to be to, or even to have certain reconstructions based on, you know, I know people in the villages who have known you know, aeons of, of, you know, they've forgotten more lore than I will ever know in my life. And they still reconstruct based on what new books get published if they get their hands on uh, the latest anthropological research out of a part of the country that they're not even from. Uh, and that's inevitable. But it's certainly the case that to be living is to be changing, to be adapting to the hands and feet of the people who are actually living it. And so that's that's what a living tradition means to me. That's what oral histories are, is they're going to be mutable. They're going to suit the needs of the people they're serving. And so... Uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, it does exist in books. It's been published before. Um, it's just not necessarily in English. And um, and some of this stuff is going to be uh, maybe a bit of a surprise to some people who are more used to more negative uh, traditions of regarding dragons um, in, uh, as something to be warded against, as something to be preserved against, as something that vampirizes women when they marry them or when they come down and seduce them, uh, that has to be banished using certain herbal washes or by burning down the tree to which they fell. Um, or burning the snake skin that they shed at night when they assume their human form. Uh, whereas I've been familiar with a lot of traditions that are very positive and see them as benevolent beings. And there are reasons in taxonomic differences for why this is the case, but without getting too ahead of myself, is just to say everything is going to be different. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> and so we shouldn't shy away from those things. And it's a, I hope it is a creative tension that um, influences to explore more of these diversities as opposed to make us want to say, oh, well, um, clearly these people that you know, you've know you interviewed are mistaken because that's not how it is in other places where this is a dangerous being where we wouldn't associate these kinds of benefit qualities to them. And nor should we say, oh, well, there's never a danger, you know, um, if the, the, the drag Dragon is a primordial uh, chaotic being of danger, certainly in most mythologies, and we should be we should do well to be wary about that. Absolutely. I would echo you completely on everything you said in regards to diversity and publishing, having worked on uh, which of the Arabic material or Islamic magic material, it's the same thing. People just want that, or people in the Anglosphere want that Bible of Arabic magic where it's all um, very neat and orderly, and there's there's no one set of lunar mansions. There's no there's no one albuni just like uh, Cyprian. You know, there's there's many albunis. There's there's quite a few albunis. Um, sometimes where he's sorcerer, sometimes where he's mystic, uh, so on and so forth. So I, I I would say it's pretty much how it is in in the rest of the world outside of the Anglosphere. You get you you get that diversity, and when you start going into oral traditions, it becomes uh, more and more obvious. So. Yes, absolutely. It's one of the main reasons I, I love speaking with you. You bring up an important distinction, which is something I'm sure would also have a diversity of responses to it. Um, but it's it's something as I was presenting on Lunar Mansions and Ophidian Spirits recently uh, for the the Salem Witchcraft and Folklore Festival. I was thinking, you know, what what are what are some of the differences? How how would we categorize dragon as opposed to serpent, as opposed to snake? Would we even see differences between those things? Um, I, I I'm sure, depending on the cultural framework, as we've been talking about, that um, we you garner various differences. But I, I'm curious to your thoughts on 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 those distinctions or how you would make those distinctions in your practice. Totally. Um across many different Indo-European cultures that have preserved uh, these understandings of stars as serpents and serpents as forces of kind of raw, raw chaotic, but also holy powers. Sometimes within various languages, you might get a very strong distinction between when you would use the word meaning snake and when you would use the word meaning serpent. So for example, a snake would refer to the animal, um, you know, the kind of referring specifically to forms of these beings as incarnate animals uh, and that they are therefore, you know, some and some living snakes could be serpents if they are particularly holy, if they've lived a very long lifetime. Um, and then in addition, a uh, dragon would refer to this perhaps same being, but with if it has wings, if it has this mastery over air as well as the earth. So in 
for example, in various Balkan cultures, you might have categories of which animals are considered to be chthonic, which are considered to be celestial, which are considered to be terrestrial, especially in those villages that have preserved this idea of an upper, middle, and lower world, for lack of a better term. And so the hedgehog, for example, and the wolf are considered, you know, very, very quintessentially chthonic animals. Uh, hedgehogs are uh, the keys, uh, the key holders to many chthonic mysteries, and are they the ones that we might petition to find things like the Raskovic, which are these. Uh, uh, I, I found it funny whenever I see, I read in English, it's like an alleged plant. Uh, it's this myth mythical plant that we don't really know what it is, but it unlocks all doors. And it's the hedgehog that um, you, you would steal the hedgehog's baby and put it in a cage. So the mother has to go find this plant to unlock the door. Or you might put an old woman in shackles and have her walk over a field and where the shackles suddenly break, that's over her feet. That must be where the Raskovic is. Um, but wolves especially. And serpents are considered to be very chthonic they're allied with the god Veles, who is this pastoral deity associated with bears and wolves and serpents and all manner of uh, agricultural as well as uh, shamanistic witchcraft uh, associated traditions of music, of art, poetry, trance, and, and trickster uh, type things. But then you also have Perun, who is sometimes seen as his adversary. It's like an it's it's essentially an order chaos conflict, but they're not truly enemies in the strictest sense, uh, where you wouldn't ever venerate both. Um, in fact, there are so many stories in which the many saints. I, I mentioned that Perun is often allied with uh, Elijah the Thunderer, the prophet Elijah. Velas is allied with gazillions of saints, you know, uh, you know everything from uh, Svati Sava, you know, Saint Sava, of, uh, who is the the, um, the father of the autocephalous Serbian Orthodox Church, uh, to Saint Michael, uh, to Saint Blaise, uh, or Blas, uh, to um, Saint Andrew, and so many other saints, and Nicholas, of course, uh, who are pastoral, uh, you know, organizing uh, order uh, saints, indeed. So it's not so simple to say that one is order and one is chaos, when they both have their own realms. And there are so many times when it's said that Perun or Ilya's lightning, his fury during the dog days of summer, which we are very much in, um, uh, need to be quelled, because he can be overzealous in his punishment. He's so pure, and he radiates so much fury that he, little things can offend him and he forgets that we are human and that we will sin that we will err and so it is the saints associated with Veles such as Sava that are petitioned to kind of calm him down to protect us from his wrath and it is uh, just as Veles is associated with serpents uh, Perun is very much associated with dragons it's said that one of the glyphs that pulls his chariot uh, where he wields his thunder axes and he creates hagstones by throwing lightning through stones and he creates fulgurites by smiting the sands and uh, he rides on in this hexafoil uh, whirling you know, fire tornado of, of lightning and and power. Uh, and he sits atop his castle of glass or crystal uh, under the iron sky through which the, the dragons themselves fall when they break through it, which is of course a, a fertility and a sexually aggressive metaphor of penetrating with iron, you know, sky iron into the earth and stirring it. Um, He's pulled, his chariot is pulled by dragons. So what is the difference? Uh, the dragons are typically associated with uh, the celestial phenomena, but it's also important to note that we have so many names that, you know, if you put them in a dictionary or on Google Translate, they will come up as dragon, but they all have different protocols. The pozoi, uh, it's P-O-Z-O-J, um, in Croatia is uh, essentially a chthonic dragon. Uh, you know, the, the head will live under a church or the tail will live under a town square or vice versa, and the shuddering of the pozoi makes... Um, earthquakes happen. And it's only the wandering black school students, uh, this sorcerer who is trained in very much similar to the Romanian ideas of the Sholomans, um, this kind of place where the, the students compete for the um, with each other. And when one remains, uh, he becomes the apprentice of the devil. He obtains a black book, uh, which teaches him the knowledge of weather magic and of all manner of things, how to leave his body, how to do all kinds of sorceries, how to obtain all this horrible cunning, and he obtains a dragon familiar. And so in creation legends of these people, it is the pozoi that they learn how to control um, and tame. And it's, and of course, interesting to note that in many places, the alleged site of this academy, the of the black school, as it were, um, are churches and monasteries that were converted into mosques or that became uh, Muslim. And so you could you could see even the, the religious tension in saying, oh, this place is now so spooky and dark and intense because it has 
become a part of a, the religion that we find foreign and a part of an invasive force, right? Whereas in plenty of places of Bosnia that have been Muslim for, for many years now, um, a dragon is a kind of jinn, and so is a serpent. <laughs> and some are fire jinn that live in, in, the, uh, in the air or in the underworld, and some are celestial jinn that are Muslim dragons. Some are not considered Muslim, but they nevertheless are the allies of jinn that are Muslim. And we see that as well in many parts of Serbia that see the dragon, the Zmai specifically, that's Z-M-A-J, um, as being a pure class of beings, a holy good, benevolent, uh, that help the angels and the saints that are the allies of these and that are blessed by God. So even when they marry women and have incredibly sexual encounters with them that are in some you know oral accounts kind of over the top in terms of their potency and virility and all the things that they're doing uh, and, and how loud this Congress is and how disruptive it can be for their village, um, it is not likened to that of the Watchers who fall down and, and sin by copulating with women and teaching them witchcraft and sorcery and all this kind of medicine medicinal and herbal cunning knowledge. Um, the, people are well aware of the Watchers, you know, the Slavonic Enoch a book, you know, Enoch 2 is very well known within the popular imaginary. And despite this, you might think, oh, so many cultures that involve serpentine beings of light and fire falling from the sky and marrying people and having sex with them and teaching women witchcraft and all these other things, which the Zizmai certainly does. Um, it's interesting that in many parts of, uh, of the Balkans, this is seen as a distinction. They might be seen as cousins or distant memories of each other, but the Zmai is a wholly good being. And there are many reasons why, including, we can explore in, in a second, including nationalistic reasons as to why. Um, but uh, without rambling too much, uh, in, in essence, we, in, in Serbian, I did not grow up seeing um, a difference between snake and serpent in the language, both are Zmija, uh, Z-M-I-J-A. But um, if you want to humiliate a serpent, a holy being, if you want to humiliate a dragon and make it subservient to you, especially one that lives in the earth, that is considered to have been, that is considered the light of a fallen star or a memory of a star that is now trapped in earth and has forgotten its origins, it may not remember which constellation it comes from, it may not remember what its pacts are. The way that you might cause it to remember, uh, it, there's certain techniques that are done that in the sorcery um, to remind it in the dream world, what, what is your tree? And by that tree, to know which stars inherently are linked to that tree and so now we can figure out which stars made you and to stir the memory of this dragon that has fallen to earth but but when you want to humiliate and humble it and for and and, and enrapture it into your servitude you instead of calling it uh, a denigrating name for snake because again we have the same word for both serpent and snake you would call it sort of crv which is worm and that exists in other cultures too, uh, in terms of, I have, I've met people who've told me in, in Finnish and Hungarian and places in the Pyrenees, absolutely, that's what you would do. Um, you would, you know, humiliate them by calling them snake instead of serpent, or you might call them worm. And uh, I find that very fascinating. So it's one of those things of like, who came first, uh, uh, the serpent or the dragon? It truly mm -hmm. depends because on the one hand, serpent involves a certain level of holiness and admiration, like this Mia Chubrakucha, but dragon involve, implies that not purely chthonic on some level. They're certain, they have wings, they, can, they are flaming beings, they are associated with meteors and thunderbolts and things that pierce the sky that trail off that are that are every star is its own dragon and every star in the galaxy in the milky way itself is the body of a great dragon that hisses and slithers or the seven planets are the heads of a dragon and the swing and, and undulating of the ecliptic is its body um we have all these memories of understandings of dragons that fell to earth and therefore lost something essential or stir it and remember it by having congress with the with the, those that they apprentice or they marry, which don't have to be humans. They can be peop, uh, land formations. Um, there's an entire map that I've made uh, of places that I've heard, a dragon married this mountain, a dragon married this river or this cave. And I've tried to, it's kind of like a conspiracy board at this point with like red tape everywhere or like a string where I've kind of been like, oh, this is, you know. Um, and then of course, what are their children? Uh, we are very famous for having this idea of a third category of dragon, right? There's one that's the, the good ones that we've called the Zmai, there's the bad ones that we call the Ejdaya, who are considered wholly terrestrial. Um, and we'll get into the differences between what we mean by the, these categories. Um, that they, that the Zmai fights, you know, St. George does not slay the Zmai, he slays the Ejdaya. Um, and St. George is the ally of the Zmai, um, much as these other saints and angels. Um, and then there's this third category, which is the Zmaiovit Chovek, or the Zmaiovit Yunek, which is like the draconic man or the draconic hero. Um, Meaning somebody who's born of the union of a woman and a dragon or a man and a dragon. 
and they have a dragon soul you can <laughs> you know skyrim music plays in the background um <laughs> and they they know how to subjugate other dragons much like the vampirich the person who is half vampire um you know a half wandering uh ghost uh that is restless and half human uh is able to perceive who else is a vampire they know who is a werewolf in the village they know who is another vampire um sorcerer or a witch um this Mayavit knows how to fight the clouds the hala the ala the ashdaya these categories lamias even that sometimes you get from get from the greek um is these uh lilith like female serpent spirits that bring uh ill winds and and issues with fertility and they hurt women and so on and these are much like the weather sorcerers like the stuhach or the oblachar or the grado um who are not necessarily considered a draconic but they have similar powers they fend against these things so it's one of those things that like what do we mean by dragon well it could also be a person a dragon incarnated a human body it could be the wife of a dragon who is considered to also be a dragon sometimes or it could be um, many other categories of, of serpent that does all manner of things. And I think that's a, an issue of language, right? It's like, well, if we if we consider all these being dragons in English, how do we deal with internal taxonomies that only see some of them as inherently celestial, that have wings of flame, that are able to rule the skies, right, the heavens, and have this association with eagles and falcons and birds that rule um you know the skies and are not purely uh chthonic. uh how do we deal with taxonomies of lizards who are punished uh on saint theater's day that crawl out and and no longer have their limbs um and how do we understand under you know notions of of holiness of which are considered to have a certain kind of divine potential I think in English, it's easy to say the dragon is the one that has this kind of celestial capacity and is capable of, of representing the stars. But that's not always easy when in other uh, dialects, serpent is the term that embodies all of these things. Um, I, I'm so, I, I got way ahead of myself. I apologize. No, it's no. just something I kind of nerd out about because <laughs> I think the I think the linguistics of it is interesting because sometimes uh, I thought about this, you know, in English, we have this, uh, you know, as in any language, we have various uh, terms that borrow off of animals that we use to describe characteristics, right? So like sly as a fox, right? But you might not say sly as a raccoon or a pelican, even though those are very sly animals for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought about this with, I was talking to a friend who doesn't, didn't grow up with any of the folklore. He, uh, you know, he's from Belgrade, um, a good friend of my family, um, who is not particularly interested in, in the folklore and isn't very aware of it. And I was saying like, you know, what are some terms that you know for dragon in English? I asked him this in English and he gave me a few and I said, are all of them the same to you? And he was like, I mean, kind of, I guess. I'm not really sure what the differences are. And I, I ran a test with him, right? Just to kind of make the, the point about this, this question. I said like, if I were to say this man is handsome, and then I would say it like anishdaya, would that make sense to you? And or like cunning or wise or smart, all these you know good qualities. And he was like, I don't know, that doesn't really sound weird. It's kind of like saying like, oh, he's sly like a pelican or something, you know. And he was like, uh, okay, so how about um, he's uh, handsome or cunning, like a pozoi or like a balawar? Um, and he's like, mm, I don't really know. I don't, I don't quite feel it. And I would say, well, what about like ismai? And his his mind clicked. He was like, "Yeah, that makes a lot of sense." Like a nickname for a very handsome man might be Smai, uh, someone who loves you aggressively to the point that, like, you know, they'll reincarnate just to be with you again if you reject them and ask you all over again. Uh, someone is persistent, but also wise and cunning and intelligent and also very good looking and or sexually virile. These are the characteristics you might assign to this. And I'm like, "Why do you think that is?" And he was like, "Well, I guess there must be a reason because he's not aware of it." But like, even in the language even in, in folks like pop songs that went on the radio and that our club hits like love me like as my you know what does that mean why is it not these other terms and i think or just that has the way that on the one hand the way that the mm -hmm. word sounds is that is that what you're saying oh. just the, the the way that it sounds to this person who doesn't know the the serbian terminology yeah in the way that, you know, I, Sly as a fox in English makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's one of those things that, like, you might not know any fox folklore, but in, inherently you might think, oh, the fox is kind of a sly animal, yeah. you know? So even if he wasn't able to articulate to me the differences that I might have grown up with around these categories of serpent and dragon, it makes sense to him that, one, it has these positive qualities, which is, of course, not yeah. true in other places where cognates such as Zmei, uh, like you might see that written as Z-M-E-I or Z-M-E-Y or Z-M-E-J, uh is more associated there's not a lot of difference like ajdaya and zmeyer or zmey are very similar in certain parts of bosnia they are very similar um and then in certain parts you cannot extract a lore from anybody <laughs> asking do you know anything about ajdaya or zmeyevi that like uh -huh. zmeyevi that marry women you have to ask do you know anything about a serpent gin that would do that and then people will be like oh, mm -hmm. of course <laughs>
So serp serpent being the broader category that encompasses the rest. Um, right? Yeah, I, you I, could I, say that these are these are serpent beings, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and in thinking about Draco, who I'm mm -hmm. the name translating to dragon, um, but also this important uh this important notion of the serpent or the dragon being on this pole being mm -hmm. affixed to to the north but it's more than just the north we're also seeing a, a structure of a of a serpent moving up a pole and it could be up or it could be down as you mentioned you mentioned mm -hmm. trees and their ability to to connect to the celestial dimension in this way um, as well as this kind of three world model wherein there is an axis in the middle right um, mm. And if if it's if if serpent is the is the primary category, then in some sense we could see Draco, which is fixed in the north, but also this north south pole distinction is 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 relative at some level at least between the two. Um, we can see this this great serpent moving between. Um, or, or moving up the pole and then back down the pole. And its position mm. when it's up at the top of the pole being more dragon-like, I guess mm. being being more winged, um, right? A, a kind of elevated position, or we could call it that. And then moving uh, down the pole, um, moving towards more of a thonic position. But the the, the serpent as a, as a broader category has the ability to, let's say, move between both, yeah? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the shedding of the skin that happens at every layer of those jumps between atmosphere of the penetration, mm. which is always a fertility connotation, right? You know, I think um, something that always comes to mind for me is this understanding that I've read some French and German articles about uh, Serbian and Balkan, you know, Serbian specifically, but also Balkan more broadly traditions of serpent magic that have referred to these Mai as this protagonist, this kind of virile hero figure, this protector of the people as being associated with Draco and even referring further to in French as Dragon um, in the translation, because uh, this is a constellation that remains in the sky. It does not dip below the horizon. Whereas the Ishdaya, who is slain by the dragon, who is the, the good dragon, as, as it were, the one who is the ally of St. George, who vanquishes this enemy dragon that is considered to be, in some ways, his twin, uh, just at the other end of the pole, uh, you know, or in some cases, you know, what he himself could become if he loses his memory of his stars is related as to Hydra, you know, Hydra, because this is uh, a constellation whose heads are severed by uh, the the horizon when it dips below it. So I find this to be especially interesting. Uh, you know, Th Tuban was the pole star uh, for a very long time, and um, the memory of that and the triumph of Polaris over it is preserved in a lot of the carnival dances. Um, you might see in, in Croatia, the Zvonchari or the Dondalashi in Bulgaria, certainly the Kukiri, which are remarkably famous and incredibly well preserved. And I defer always to um, the incredible scholarship out of Bulgaria on the Kukiri traditions that is now becoming more popular even in English. Um, for the tremendous outpouring of scholarly research into the ways those dances preserve certain star uh, memories and glyphs. And, and for us, even the uh, the very same dancers in these bear costumes that appear on Slavic Carnival, um, you know, for our Bele Poklade, these in are preserving in some ways, like the way that the bears come in and, and scare out the serpents and scare out these uh, Catholic entities uh, and and start to announce the the coming dawn of uh, future warmer months in the middle of the winter uh, is also a memory of the bear sun myth triumphing over the serpent uh, and us entering an age now in which it is the age of human it is the age of man it is we, we were descended from bears although interestingly um, uh, in Serbian mythology often we you know the, the people trace their history and descent from wolves because of Daibog or, or um, Dabog this uh, Velasin Chakanovich one of our famous ethnologists uh, had a has a beautiful book about the um, old Slavic conceptions of um, uh, South Slavic conceptions, excuse me, of Dabog as the supreme deity who is the sun that is also chthonic and his emblem is that of the wolf, not the wolf that eats the sun or that threatens to swallow it, uh, but the the loyal and the holy wolf 
that is also able to traverse uh, the world mountain or the world tree. But it is the serpent that is fixed upon the axis, absolutely. And I think that um, sometimes as we get into some strange oral lore that gets a little bit like fuzzy about the distinctions between these things, I think it's worth asking, what is the function of these beings in the lore? Without getting too caught up in taxonomies or wanting very distinct and concrete categories of what this uh, constellation represents or what these spirits or, or beings are um, as essential qualities that are not mutable. I think it's good to ask what is the function they're fulfilling in the cosmology, even temporarily in this moment, because so many of these things, as, as you're very aware of, um, change with the seasons and change with the passage of time. Um, so something that I like to think about as well is how can we understand the role of these uh, that these characters in our mythic play um, act out uh, through the harvest cycle, you know, through the various, uh, you know, because the folk uh, astrologies, if you will, the, you know, no one is looking at their birth chart necessarily in these villages, but they are certainly paying attention to stars. And when is a good time? What are good omens to harvest things? Many of the saint feasts are um, very much overlapping in terms of like which saint feasts say you shouldn't do any physical labor on, you shouldn't soap. Uh, seeds on which ones are the ones that are definitely should be sowing and harvesting on are related to stellar phenomena um, and in Bosnia, especially with lunar mansions uh, in uh, parts of Serbia, hugely related to various uh, pre-Christian understandings of constellations that are hugely influenced by Hellenic beliefs as well. So just as you might have in, there's a great book by Daniel Ogden called Dracon, uh, which I highly recommend to anyone interested in uh, any kind of dragon related uh, folklore, because he has does a beautiful job of looking into the shifting uh, relationship of, of the, the metaphor of the dragon in ancient Greek thought. And he notes so many uh, interpretations of Draco from a castrated uh, you know, serpent that was flung into the sky and preserved in this way, having been triumphed over by heroes to preserving the battle between Hercules and, uh, you know, Ladon to being, um, you know, Hesiodic poetry already was describing Draco as a flowing river, uh, you know, for, and also as a, a wind that goes through the different worlds, you know, to, um, uh, Typhon attacking the heavens, um, or Ophicius uh, being that which uh, sustains the heavens and allows it to be uh, the ho the horn of an Illyrian deer. Uh, that you know, which and, and deer horns, deer antlers are used so much in subjugating and waking up the memories of dragons and a lot of the folk magic around these parts. So there's so, it's so beautiful to see that the sheer diversity of these things, including like. Um, uh, the various different kinds of uh, animals that these spirits become once they're in the skies. But I think it's worth noting that, you know, to ask ourselves, what is the function that is being fulfilled here? I think that's uh, in some ways a more fruitful uh, avenue rather than asking uh, what is some essential quality that we can define this uh, to the exclusion of other categories. I mean, functionally, the the pole star, it, I, I mean, I, of course, there's this distinction, right, between cultures that are further north and and further south. Um, the the southern mm -hmm. pole having its own set of of constellations associated, but mm -hmm. I mean, so that that's its own thing. Um, northern cultures and and those distinctions functionally, like you said, it it would seem in the in the greater story arc that there is a great importance held on on the stars that do not die, as as you mentioned, right? And mm -hmm. and what that is that memory is not severed or lost, but it would seem that that. That primary position has been revoked at least temporarily, right? Uh, Thuban was the the pole star, what roughly four thousand to to six thousand years ago, and and will be. I think it said something like AD uh, twenty one thousand years or something like that. Um, yeah, it it it's uh, it's speaking to 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 world ages, which in some sense even. Uh, transcends the the seasonal cycle at least if we're talking about pole stars and their relationship to that mm -hmm. how, how would you how would you respond to to your own inquiry around that uh, the the functionality of of the pole star or even more particular than that a, a pole star which is no longer considered to be the pole star in in the current age some of the folklore that i've encountered that I found exceptionally fascinating because it's not purely like I I used to think oh this is an interesting piece of folk and folklore and then I later on found out oh it's very common to many different uh, regions 
regions of Europe that are mountain regions that, you know, are deeply invested in mountain folklore. And what happens when, you know, a halakhal rise of a star doesn't happen that early in the morning because you're waiting for it to go over the mountain to ascend over these, uh, you know, very totemic glyphs, if you will, of um, the axis itself is um, a memory of an of a bygone age in which humans were not the ones that had access to magic. We're not perhaps yet created, or in some stories, we're not yet capable of wielding um, somebody's powers. There's notions of a serpent age, um, when Tuban was the pole star of a time in which serpents uh, essentially dominated the world. And there was no distinction between um, the ways that these kind of aggressive fertility cycles carried out. And our ability to understand this age is lost. Um, it's said that we don't really know how to engage with it or how to really interpret it's what that life must have been like. But at some point, once um, the Polaris triumphed, we entered the age of man. And serpents are still around everywhere, but we may have lost the ability to speak to them. There is this interesting term, the word itself is a little archaic, even in modern Serbian, called a nemushti jezik. So jezik is tongue or um, language. But nemushti, it's, uh, <laughs> nemushti jezik is kind of funny. I've translated it personally uh, as unintelligible tongue. Um, it can mean, you know, the 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 language that is you know you can't understand necessarily um or the mute language sometimes interestingly uh just in the sense that like you can't understand it right it's, it's like it doesn't make sense to you it doesn't actually hit your ears and this is said variously to be um the language that animals speak the language that spirits speak there's certain spirits that can grant it usually it is a king or a tsar like an emperor of serpents that is capable of giving it or an emperor of dragons um and in various folk tales including uh, literally a folk tale recorded by Vukkarajic which literally means is, is called Nemushti Yazik. Um, there's also one that's like the um, miraculous ring um, and various other versions of this tale in which a hero rescues a um, she dragon, a dragoness or a, uh, a female serpent from who's choking on a deer. The antlers are about to penetrate her skull, essentially. Uh, she's unable to swallow the deer whole. And by rescuing her, uh, she thanks him and says, you know, I'm going to take you to my father, who's the king of the serpents, and uh, you can ask him for a gift. And what I recommend, in some version of the story, she says, don't accept anything he might offer you in return for saving me, except for the ability to speak this language, which is the very language that was spoken by all me uh, during the age of the serpent, when Dubin was the full star. Um, and this would, would grant our hero access, not only to speaking with any being that exists or any spirit, but having this uh, genetic memory now of what magic was like then. It's essentially a witchcraft initiation because it renders you unto like a serpent, allows you to slither up and down that pole, and allows you to um, interact with spirits in a way that churns and forces their memories to come back, much like the antlers penetrating the skull um, of many of these beings, to remember what are their trees, what are their packs, which stars made them. Because there is a kind of loss that occurs when these beings descend to Earth. Some folk tales I've encountered involve an, a male heavenly dragon, a sort of a lord of the atmosphere of the skies, uh, whose body itself is variously the Milky Way or is the ecliptic or is many of these things. Um, and a mother dragon, sometimes known as the mother of the moist earth, um, which is also Mika Vlezna Zemnia, which is, which is her name in Serbian, um, is you know a, a name much associated with Mokosh, a very beloved deity, much associated with St. Bethka, with many of these goddesses and saints that are deeply associated with fertility and with magic and witchcraft, with spinning and weaving and fate. Um, Sujanitsa, the um, these three fate goddesses, you know, one that one that uh, measures, one that sorry, excuse me, one that weaves or generates, one that measures, and one that severs. Um, but it, suffice to say, there are some interesting legends about her being a she dragon um, in her original form before she was able to present a human face to us in the form of another uh, goddess, Ogina. Um, and without going too much into that, I think it's fascinating to see how. Um, you know, this memory of the friction between them as they slither and rub their scales against each other, as the moisture of the black earth meets this flaming, uh, you know, gorge of the night sky as it erupts with the solar flares that, you know, hit our atmosphere and become aurora borealis and so on, or these kind of solar flares, these green lights that are considered so intrinsic to troops of fairy queens descending from the Pleiades or troops of dragons who are also considered to be the Pleiades themselves, uh, slithering down as fireballs and as meteorites, that this friction causes uh, a static 
that will pull individual stars or individual dragons out of the body of the sky dragon that will fall into the earth and impregnate and wake up the dormant stars that are in the mother dragon. And this is sometimes a metaphor for how dragon marriages happen. So when we talk about the erotic ability of these spirits, it is in some way a memory of this uh, time in which the serpents ruled everything and they were able to create uh, a world uh, that was hostile to human beings, right? Not at all friendly, not a time you necessarily want to live in. Um, it is a time when everything was a monstrous uh, non-human witch and nothing had an ally to human beings or was in any way interested in advocating for them or protecting them. But when the when Polaris triumph, we now have an age in which, while life can still be difficult and harsh for humans, there are advocates that protect us. There are deities that, are, um, uh, which are traditionally you know, very much not invested in our well-being and are very anti-human. Now there is a triumph uh, thing, you know, Heracles, Hercules-type figure that has ascended and you know leads a procession of more human-faced deities forward that is able to protect us. And so, uh, although we have lost this, you know, the witches who are initiated into these mysteries might have access to this unintelligible tongue and might slowly remember um, there's like a male form of it some villages say and a female form of it where some you have to learn from the male dragon and some you must learn from the female dragon by being swallowed and rebirthed by her um, and only once you know both halves of the tongue um, do you know how to command this language and be able to command spirits with it but I think that the function of language and communication is an interesting one for the pole star uh, and, and uh, you know, question, I suppose, because I think it's also, it's about communication, it's about history, it's about the memory of of so much of, of stories about folk magic and witchcraft are truly about relationality and about emotions. It's who advocates for you? Um, even a witch who's transformed into this monstrous other by having her soul ripped apart and new souls are put into her in pacts, she is ultimately a nobody. Um, it is it is the spirits that she has pacts with that advocate for her and on her behalf to other beings. And a part of that is the function of this unintelligible tongue. Um, so when we think about uh, notions of these dragons that come down and marry the land, marry this mountain, and then every animal on that mountain, if it lives past a certain threshold, could become a dragon. This is how you get the when you hear of stories of like, oh, this woman was pursued by this young dragon who was in love with her in this village, and we had to bathe her with these herbs that repel him and and set fire to his home so that he leaves her alone. When you wonder this this type of dragon, this tyrannical lover, um, seems so different from these uh, stories that I've shared of this noble, uh, sensual being that's wise and incredibly intelligent and still voracious in in their sexual appetite certainly, but is also um, a deeply guiding spirit. And um, what is uh, sometimes uh, it's hard when the same name is used for both of them but the stories that I've encountered say the ones that are very tyrannical and very um, not particularly understanding of human limitations and don't particularly um, care to initiate you into any particular mysteries but more haul you off into their world um, these are young dragons they are a ram uh, a serpent, like a literal, excuse me, a literal snake, a carp, carp are exceptionally, uh, um, incredibly sacred to these uh, dragons, um, or many other kinds of even roosters, um, eagles, uh, animals that have lived beyond a certain capacity, beyond the normal lifespan. And after a certain point, it can be four, nine years for the carp, it can be 40 years for the serpent, it could be a certain number of years for the ram. Um, would become a dragon, would eventually shed their human, their excuse me, not the human form, their uh, animal form, you know, shed their physical earthly limitations and become this flaming being, uh, because that is the child of this stellar serpent and this mountain or this valley or this cave or this river that they have married. Uh, whereas, as I mentioned, the hero, the kind of half-human uh, Skyrim protagonist, if you will, uh, that is the Izmaya Vitrovic, so popular in the stories from Albania, from Serbia, from Montenegro, and many of these other countries, this hero is ultimately... Um, the product of a serpent uh, or a dragon that has married a woman or a man and has created these um, this offspring. So I think that um, there's an interesting distinction there, right? In the the older ones that are directly fallen from the stars that immediately come from a spouse, or the one that has married a land and then the the child that results of this, which was originally an animal, who will often said to seek out the person who shares their birthday. So if they were made into a dragon, let's say in 1990, they might seek someone who was born in the same year and on the same day that they became. Became a dragon to marry and they may not take no very well for an answer they may be the ones where a lot of the divorce stories or the the famous serbian and bulgarian washing rituals georgi mishev has an excellent book on this on bulgarian washing rituals um with these herbal baths that are done to protect someone from a tyrannical zmei or vila uh, fairy or dragon lovers 
um, take place. So it's not to say that, you know, again, oral law being what it is and these terms being what they are, it's not to say that um, the, there's no such thing as a tyrannical or a difficult marriage with one of these spirits that they all don't work out or all of them do. It's more to say that there are, there's interesting law I've encountered to explain why some work so well and some don't, why in some villages the woman who is married to a dragon is essentially a shamanistic intercessor between worlds who is herself, her spine is related to the axis between the stars. It's said that, you know, because the dragon, that you know, the, the spine is the serpent of the body and the bump on the back of your neck is the mountain upon which the dragon's lightning bolt or the tree upon which his meteorite descends and and becomes this pact um why she becomes this character of upright power and continuity within her community where people might petition her on and ask her uh, convince your husband to protect us from the hail give us fertility give us a good harvest may our crops grow well this year protect us from invaders um Quick aside, actually, uh, there was a YouTube video that I saw that was all about people talking about folklore on World War II and how they escaped um, occupation and persecution. And many people said that it, there were flaming balls of, of fire with long tails that they refer to as dragons. Sometimes the, the colloquial form of what a, you would call a meteor in some of these villages just is dragon. There's no other word for it. Much like in some villages, the term for a vampire, a vampire, is just vuk, which is just wolf. Um, so and they were saying, you know, this dragons protected us from uh, invading uh, Nazi forces, uh, or a, a famous dragon hero who is long dead, uh, physically apparated and protected us. Uh, uh, they they are bound to service of the people uh, because they are these heroic spirits. So as much as there's a lot we can say about um, anti Ottoman Empire nationalist propaganda in which the dragon becomes this heroic figure in a lot of the epic poems and is constructed deliberately as a protector of the people compared to the Ishdaya, this um, chthonic or terrestrial fire-breathing multi-headed uh, beast that is the one that guards gold and is more like the Fafnir or more like typical European conceptions of dragons that are particularly negative and have to be slain by a hero um, as associated with the Turkish enemy. Much in that way, I think it's also worth noting that, yes, there are these nationalistic conceptions uh, for why that might be the case, but it's also pre-existing lore, uh, just orally, of these distinctions and, and inherently. And just as some peoples get categorized under certain you know, uh, glyphs in order to further a particular nationalistic agenda or a particular rebellious spirit, and why a certain military commanders and uh, voivode and despots who are considered especially courageous and major instruments of political rebellion are linked to this Mai, why so many of them have the epithet Smai as a kind of hero, possibly half dragon figure who is trying to rebel on behalf of the oppressed peoples. Um, we also have this, again, this lore of um, how these spirits are made. They come from the stars, they marry certain things, and then the blood in some ways, the memory dilutes further and further until the dim, the dim light is barely um, uh, revealed. And so as they are further from their source, they become more animalistic and uh, more prone to causing this kind of terror. I, I find all of this so fascinating how it interweaves with you bringing up um, nationalistic um, you know, sentiments around this and and you you talked about these fireballs in World War II as as well as things like dragon lineages, right? which uh, this interweaving between not only nationalistic languages, although there's much crossover with what I was gonna say was um, so much. Uh, conversation around conspiratorial circles um who talk about all of these kinds of things uh the 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 reptilian lineages and and this sort of stuff um and and these fireballs and and how the language is so important in the way that we contextualize these things the the language and and the culture that we're approaching it from um it's but it I, it sort of begs the question, especially around the the, the lineage component, and if we're thinking about the the functionality of of the dragon at the pole, but also that this is not um, this is no longer the pole star. Um, it will return to be the pole star in 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 twenty thousand years, but is is no longer. Um, I I'm thinking about. Uh, show that I did with Langston Khan about the North Star, which isn't the same as Polaris, but there is this element of, of being called to purpose, of being called to calling with the, with the Pole Star, with the North Star. There's something of of Draco as the, the Pole Star or the North Star for those who are of a, a different 
kin, um, which once again, it, it, in, 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 it becomes so conspiratorial for, for many, um, but I don't think that it has to be because it's so deeply entrenched in the folklore of, of and the mythology of so many cultures. <laughs> um, but I, I, I find that interesting, the same like calling towards the, toward, towards the pole, calling towards one one's home or the essence of one's being uh, is different if you're looking at the old pole star right as as opposed to like um what what polaris would would be for 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 human beings um the uh, thuban or, or or draco would be for those who who come from from different lineage absolutely does that make sense also, <laughs> mm -hmm. no yeah. totally I think that goes to the heart of a lot of these questions of, um, you know, who, who are you calling upon? Who are you convoking? You know, who the invocation that is also an exorcism, this conjuration by swearing an oath. Um, who, what are you calling upon in these in these stories with the language that you use with your breath and your saliva, which is so essential to so much of folk magic, right? You know, is I, I think a lot about um, how important it is to note the the distinction that is made by, uh, you know, let's say witches, which are allied with serpents and are considered to have serpents in their bodies that are the stars that do align with certain body parts and that they have to inoculate and make pacts with and sew back together when they rip up. <laughs> and also, and, and other kinds of sorcerers that are said to have control and power over spirits through particular lenses of training, but are not considered to be part of this other monstrous nature, this heralding to a past time that you still don't belong to necessarily, right? You know, the, 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 I've, I've often, uh, one of the people that I've interviewed kind of extensively about conceptions of witchcraft in Eastern Europe, um, mentioned to me, you know, the, the witch does not get this uh, you know, for, free for all card of power. You know, she is as much a victim and in, in many ways a non consensually created creature uh, of these forces as anything else. Uh, you know, she may be related to spirits in a particular way, but she's not fully of them nor fully of the humans anymore. So it is a especially pernicious category to uh, be informed by. Uh, because, you know, you are calling to a pole star that is no longer the pole star, and that is your alliance, but you are, but you only, you know, slide by by the skin of your teeth, as it were, through the relationships you have and the spirits that advocate for you, that have their own ag agendas for advocating for you. There is a phenomenal short film out of Bosnia and Herzegovina produced in 2016 called Ajdaya. Uh, you can search it up on YouTube, Ajdaya slash The Dragon 2016. It's a film by Ivan Ramadan that is really well done. And it shows a group of people dancing kolo uh, to venerate a, a dragon. And note that the term ashdaya, right? I, I kind of use that even in the, my writings as uh, kind of archetypally the, the negative dragon, the one that this my subjugates again, right? It's the one that St. George slays. But in some dialects, there is no difference. Ashdaya and Zmai are one. It just depends on, uh, they, if they're both considered jinn, it depends on what kind of jinn they are. You know, are they, what is their religion? Who do they follow? Or are they considered to be from which realm, right? All these things get all messy. But to me, the, the story is quintessentially about what I'm referring to as this might. But again, that gets a little confusing with the with the vocabulary. But I recommend everyone to check it out on YouTube. It's only 12 minutes long and there's no dialogue. So you're not going to miss out anything by not knowing um, uh, how to speak, uh, you know, the Serbo-Croatian Bosnian language. And it shows a group of people dancing Kolo as a heavenly meteor like you know black bodied dragon that is flaming you know very much kind of like the sky iron metaphor comes down to join with a flaming serpent that is his bride and that the whole community is worshiping and over time you get to see that the community has forgotten how to do this like, and you if this was a collective fertility ritual that is done on eclipses um then which, which is, is is depicted very dramatically in the short movie um, this is something that people have forgotten. You can see they are still acting in the function of this protector of village boundaries, this one who uh, fights against these uh, omens of ill wind and of, um, of disease and plague, but over time loses the power to do so because fewer and fewer people are doing this in the present, and the only ones who are doing this ritual are now just the ancestor spirits. No one currently incarnated is doing this. And then the movie switches to in time, this dragon is unable to manifest to protect the people. 
Instead, a woman who is again, this is a silent film. This is so not a silent film. It's just a dialogueless film. It's not a. It's not one with, with dialogue. It's not explicitly stated. This is my interpretation as someone who's a bit of a nerd about these things. Um, there is a woman in white who is to me the quintessential is my Nevesta. This is my bride, the, uh, the 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 pure virgin who is you know linked to Ogina Maria and all these other female characters, um, who calls to this dragon and has him come back. And the flaming serpent that was his wife that is in the earth re-emerges out of her and they intertwine again and create a new eclipse and he's able to come back in full power and protect the people again and to me this beautiful film uh, very well animated very well done uh really is uh um in some ways a retelling of the very story we you and i've been talking about um which is this idea that actually this used to be a communal ritual. This used to be at times a memory that was, it did not have to incarnate into individual humans. It was a power that people would maintain through their own cycles. And as they have forgotten to do this, as they have forgotten, uh, you know, through many, um, you know, centuries of, of of oppression and religious change and everything, uh, that now certain people embody dysfunction. The the female dragon energy, as it were, the kind of mother of the moist earth's daughters, the that express themselves with the holy fire of the fiery Mary, as we call her, Okina Maria, and reemerges into individuals. Right. So often you've heard me uh, probably use a uh, female or feminine uh, nouns for this. There are men who embody this role. Absolutely. They're sometimes like handsome shepherds and particularly brave and pure hearted men who uh, as mates, uh, females might, might fall in love with. Um, uh, there's quite a few stories out of the village uh, of this phenomenon, so it's absolutely not the case. If you've ever heard people kind of write and say, oh, the corollary to Asmai in terms of a female character in, that, you know, patrons heroes and protects them and also is this kind of wild, uh, incredibly hypersexual being that teaches but also punishes is the Vila, is the fairy. I don't think this is the case because there are so many she dragons. There are many dragonesses uh, across Bulgaria, Serbia, Macedonia, um, you know, Albania, uh, and all the other countries. Uh, all, the whole peninsula uh, is full of these stories. Um, Vile, of course, have a very important links to dragons. There's even the Vilos Mai, the literal fairy dragon, and uh, it's um, the you know dragonflies themselves are called fairy horses in our languages, um, and you know are said to be you know kingfishers and dragonflies are incredibly sacred to both. Fairies and dragons both. Um, but it is to say that there, there absolutely are the, the reverse gendered form. But I think the short film, if uh, anyone wants is interested in, in looking it up after uh, listening to us, uh, is very illuminating in describing, a, just without any words, portraying so much of this idea of these cycles going from something that was uh, communally tended to and then being forgotten. And now that that energy has to go somewhere and so now that's why we get so many in the last thousand uh, some years especially so many stories of the individual women and men who these virgins that get consecrated to become the mothers and, and fathers of the next uh lineage of this kind of serpent blood that forms its own uh link and so you, when you have witch families that describe themselves as having serpent blood or having watcher blood or wh however much they want to whatever depending on their religion and depending on their particular affinities however one they want to construct that um it's usually they, they say it's you know our ancestor comes from these stars and is this particular serpent or dragon and the blood is diluted in us in a generation and so one day someone else will be born to us that will marry a new dragon all over again it'll be the reincarnation of the, the the wife or the spouse of one of these dragons and we'll restart the lineage so well said um i'm gonna have to check out the film and uh link it in the show notes but I, I have to bring it up. We don't have to linger on it for, for too long at all um, because I don't think it's that important, in, that important in the grand scheme of things. But for much of what we're talking about, uh, not only dragon lineage, but serpent blood aligning uh, with, in particular, Draco, uh, I have to bring up Chum Chumbly's dragon book. Mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah i i just i'm i'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, what what draco looks like in in that context and i mean you know, acknowledging from the very beginning this is sort of the uh, how how would i put it like the the upg the the very scholarly and upg version of so much of of what we're talking about where where these things are actually deeply embedded in culture and ritual um but yeah, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that before we go back into some deeper stuff. I am not somebody who is extremely familiar with uh, Chambly's voluminous and prolific works. I've I've read um, 
parts of, of many of his essays and books, but um, I'm not someone who has a great deal of familiarity with the Dragon Book of Essex and the way that he's constructed that system. I was very drawn to the table of correspondences that he uses, um, in which he links various stellar points to parts in the body, and he links certain um, domains, uh, fixed stars, as well as constellations to uh, aspects of the body, as well as days of the week and planets and so on. I found that to be especially interesting. Um, and I think and in some ways very evocative of some of the folklore that I know that involves which stars goes in which parts of the body. And this changes for each person, each initiate. Um, I've heard whispers in various villages that talk about, yes, you know, the each person will inevitably cultivate their own internal, uh, you know, conception of where these things are seated in them through various initiation rituals that they go through. Um, but some things are always the same, um, especially in certain points on the body. But I find that um, from the little that I've looked at it and again I'm, I'm I don't necessarily someone who's an expert in, in Chumbly's work at all um I found it interesting that how masculine he kind of frames these mysteries um I wouldn't be surprised mm. if he had a, a great deal of um oral access to some people who are from mountain cultures that preserve some of this kind of information because I'm very aware uh while my kind of turf as it were is the Balkan Peninsula it is uh and, and you know my, my languages of access uh you know I can read in many of these languages but I I primarily the one that I speak is server creation um uh is always going to reflect in my research you know I I always defer to people who do far more research in Bulgarian Macedonian and Albanian to articulate those mysteries that I've, I've read a great deal of them but you know you, it's never the same as being able to actually go into these villages directly and actually talk to people um but I found it interesting that in Chumbly's his construction of these dragons are very very masculine to me the earth dragon by necessity must be female um, and the mysteries of this uh, must be kind of coded alongside this polarity. So I, I would say that was a major thing that threw me off uh, reading a lot of his work, like which I, I have an immense amount of respect for. So this is not in any way, um, you know, to say that it's just a different thing. It's like oral, right? It's going to be different. But to me, the so much of the mysteries that I'm familiar with necessitate this interaction between the sky and the earth and the moisture of it and the ways that this mother dragon might become imprisoned and the map of the galaxy of all the constellations should become imprisoned with her and how she has to recreate it out of her memory and how she enters certain dreams in order to and enters our dreams into uh, articulating these things and the various emissaries including the the holy twins you know the moon and the and the sun and and various other things and how they they map onto this uh this cosmology. So that's one thing that I found kind of curious was uh, I found it to be kind of, um, yeah, very much uh, interesting uh, gender polarities uh, evidence through his work, because to me, I'm like, wait, where's mom? <laughs> I, and thinking about Draco, would you, I mean, uh, how more masculine, more feminine, more androgynous, just as a, a stellar being, what what would you lean towards? In, in many of the of the folk that I've encountered, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, in much of the folklore I've encountered, um, I've heard every variation of this. You know, I've heard um, in many of the stories. You know, I was mentioning before in like some of the Greek myths, right? Very masculine in terms of like Ladon and Typhon, but then you also have uh, notions of the Lamia. You know, also being linked to these uh, very same constellations, and uh, you have. Um, I, I I am obsessed with the chaos Kampf type a uh, category of uh of, of folktale or mythology right you know like Tiamat and Apsu uh being slain by the new gods you know Marduk attacking Tiamat in this kind of neo-Babylonian uh cylinder seals from Nimrud right you know and even the the, the in the earliest extant image actually of Perseus Andromeda um uh and the Kitos of Ethiopia being from from these things so I, I found, or even like Gilgamesh and Enkidu slaying the, the wild man, Umbaba, uh, relating so much to the earliest images that we have of Perseus decapitating Medusa. So I find, um, you know, the, the kind of notion of like the, the chaos, uh, uh, especially a female archetype being slain by the hero and then the world being made out of her body. And even when these beings are considered inherently androgynous, they're often spoken of in female pronouns and terms, um, like Tiamat herself. Uh, being this kind of sometimes depicted as a chaos dragoness uh, whose body makes the world and her second husband Kingu um, who is also her son that she makes after Apsu is, is felled by the gods um, she uh, you know his blood is the one that actually makes the people when they are born so all of us have a little bit of dragon DNA in that way 
Um, and of course, you know, the Drakaina or the Petian, uh, you know, is is hugely uh, linked to all these mysteries. So it's interesting. I've heard every variation of what it is. Typically, I hear uh, Draco spoken of in male terms in a lot of the asterisms and a lot of the kind of astrological folklore that I'm familiar with. But uh, there's a great acknowledgement of inherently being an androgynous being. And there's different... Um, uh, constellations that are sometimes linked to the the mother dragon that I'm referring to, um, sometimes very specific constellations, sometimes very specific stars. But I often you you hear of of her also having her seven heads being the seven planets, right? Um, which I think is also very beautiful. So uh, all to say, this is this is me couching everything in my in my you know ethnographic training of of always trying to emphasize the the sheer plurality of these traditions. Uh, and 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 on my end, I have always seen. Um, uh, Draco as uh, and as being in some ways as you as you beautifully illustrated before <clears throat> excuse me the the summit of a particular kind of pole and then uh, there's an adir as well uh, that opposes the zenith I, I think a lot in terms of like at a certain point what is this crown dragon that as it reaches you know the heavens and becomes winged and becomes this kind of celestial creature and what is it when it uh, you know forks into into the underworld's staying, you know, this kind of forked head as it penetrates the underworld and, and what is its kind of dual gendered nature and those things. I think it's really fascinating to, to meditate on. Exactly. It's it's more of a, a process at work as opposed to any kind of you know, static uh, or even distinct being. And I love that you brought in the the various skin sheddings that occur um, as as these as as this process unfolds and as the transformation happens, and this is the the great magic of the of the time serpent in in that way. Um, but I in in I guess trying to stay focused on the the dragon or the serpent of the north, I do think that there is this emphasis on the sky, and and you've been saying some incredible things um, in relationship to to weather phenomena as well as falling stars and celestial ph phenomena, the you know the the bobbing of the the planets on the ecliptic, and and all of this is beautiful and extremely important. I uh, I, I know that this is uh, something of a of a specialty of yours, but um, in focusing on on the sky dragon or on the sky serpent in particular mm -hmm. um i would love to hear more about uh, dragons and their relationship to to weather phenomena like i'm i'm thinking lightning i'm thinking storms and as well as any other stellar connections that you feel uh might be relevant to the conversation oh absolutely so uh, you'll have to excuse me as I, I go over a little bit of vocabulary uh in terms of just because i find I, I got a little nerdy about some of these things I I think it's so fascinating. No, it's welcome. It's wholly welcome. To... Okay, awesome. <laughs> awesome. So one of the, I've in a class actually that I did for the Salem Witchcraft and Folklore Festival um, 2022, I believe, was on, I, I refer to them as like the weather sorcerers, the warriors of St. Elijah. And this is a category I've mentioned before that is deeply embedded in, in draconic mysteries, but also exists outside of them and sometimes in memory of them. And I think it's worth um, to talk a little bit about the weather phenomena. I think it's it's worth very briefly, because this could be, this is again a thing that I've I've uh, done a great deal of research on and published on as well. Um, and it's very well attested in uh, Serbian ethnographic and anthropological literature. I also come from a part of Serbia that is kind of well known for them. And uh, there's actually a museum uh, shortly outside of where I was born that does, that did a whole exhibit on, on these people that I think is is good to um, always keep in mind. So without further ado, these um, uh, these individuals, right, you know, are often born in a call. And uh, when you look at uh, what that is, you know, this idea of like a serpent's skin already imposed upon the person, allowing them to see into another world, right? You know, this is something that it marks a lot of people, especially those who are born on Thursdays or born on calls, um, as someone who will inherently have a tenuous relationship to their own body. They'll be prone to leaving it involuntarily to fight these uh, spirits of ill weather. Sometimes they're described as lamias, as I mentioned, as a hala, as an ala, as a majdaya. Um, and they are uh, often female coded spirits of disease and uh, and hail and ill winds and uh, you know ill luck and bad fertility and so on. So when you look at the spirits that combat them, often they are this uh, Carlo Ginsberg's very famous night battles uh, you know a book as well as ecstasies. They he he analyzes the contest between the Benandanti, uh, a very similar kind of callborn weather sorcerer, and their fights 
not only with demons of the weather and witches, but also their their counterparts, the malandanti, you know, these kind of witch-like uh, figure um, that is there to do to you know um, bring about uh, all, the opposite of what you'd want for a coherent community. I highly recommend Eva Posh's book Between the Living and the Dead, which not only looks at comparisons between the Berendanti and, and Balkan and specifically Hungarian forms, uh, like the Daltos, but is also one of the first books translated into English to really discuss the Dragon Man phenomenon that I've been talking about. She does it's mention this at the sort of yeah. yeah it's a good so, one. Per, per your I recommendation. That, <laughs> yeah. And I think that she does an excellent job of outlining these things. Carla Ginsburg does as well. So within the the place, you know, where I'm from, when I look at a lot of these things, we have quite a few different um, categories uh, of of sorcerer that can kind of embody this thing. And some people have described them very explicitly as shamans. Um, I'm going to use the more, in some ways, neutral sorcerer, just to kind of avoid some of the baggage that comes with describing them as shamans, even if their community, it's true, genuinely uh, do refer to them sometimes as the word shaman, the um, being uh, terms both that are, you know, available in our language. So the zduhach, the zduhach, the zduvach, the zduhach, the zduha, the zduva, these are all, you know, uh, completely uh homonymic um and it comes from the word duch meaning spirit or breath um vetrovniak coming from vetar meaning wind uh the, the weather maker in some ways oblachar from oblak meaning cloud uh the cloud maker you know grado branite uh literally a uh, grad is uh is quite literally hail and someone who's a branite is someone who defends against it so defender from hail you also get kursnik uh especially in croatia from kurst meaning cross or kres, meaning bonfire or change of the seasons. Um, and of course you get this Mayavitrovic, right? You know, which is kind of like the same phenomenon with the added plus asterisk of like the reason they were born in a call and have scaly armpits and have wolf paws for hands or have breathe fire as baby is because they are, um, you know, related to the celestial fire, just kind of dragon energy. So these individuals, you know, they fly out from their bodies and they fight um, the Allah, the Hala, the Ishtaya. I've always seen this code or this category of spirits is kind of linked to these other broader categories of like Liliths, um, you know, that so much of Babylonian and Aramaic and Syriac and Hebrew, uh, you know, demon enchantment bowls, like those spiraling, uh, you know, invocation bowls are, are dedicated to preventing um, the uh, attacks from and to protect women, especially pregnant women from them. But they engage in these incredibly intense battles. Um, their tools will be agricultural tools, um, including rakes at size, sometimes like ladles and pots and pans from within the kitchen or a uh, stick of fat wood that is burnt on both ends that becomes in their hands a lightning bolt like when they leave their bodies. And you're not supposed to disturb their bodies when they're flailing around and fighting things, even if you get scared for them and you see their body incur physical damage you know, streaks of blood forming, bruises, you have to, they could die in this process. So you want to guard their body and wave a sickle or a scythe over their head so that um, when they're in this trance, when they fall down involuntarily to fight, um, to ensure that, that no other spirit attempts to enter their body and possess them while they are in this place. So there's a lot of contesting over tools and implements. Um, sometimes you get stories of military regiments or wars between villages, provinces, or even countries um, of taking place where essentially, uh, you know, some of these Duhachi will say, you know, I'll meet you and your faction uh, on this mountain in the dream world and we'll fight each other and see who's stronger. You know, so sometimes they get into these very rowdy kind of battles. But I think this is uh, in some ways also emblematic of the clashes between um, the various atmospheric spirits. Uh, we have this category called the Vetrani Voivoda which I would translate that loosely as wind dukes that have their own councils. They have their own societies where they meet and, you know, the Southeast wind will meet with this Northwest, you know, wind and they will fight and they will clash and they will ultimately, um, or make peace. And this can be seen as a, in some ways, a broader memory of, tides of luck and fertility and, and wind being not only a carrier of breath and of, of spirit energy, but also a fortune of um, disease, of health, and, and so on, especially for these agricultural cycles, right? So when we're talking about dragons as related to celestial weather phenomena, um, I think a lot of these different um, particular um, um, excuse me, um, a lot of these particular understandings of dragons as patrons, including St. George, uh, you know, being hugely a patron of this kind of art, St. Elijah, again, uh, these, these dragon commanding and subjugating saints that are linked to these primary fertility and order deities um, are, are so linked to these arts. It's, 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 it's only a memory of this mediation. In some villages, uh, Azduhach will be the one that people 
directly petition to physically fight these spirits in order to protect them. Whereas uh, in, in ones where there's a dragon bride, they might ask her husband to do that job for her. And she may not be the one to fly out and do this. So she, if she does, it would be to ride him and, and use her witchcraft. But it certainly would be something that um, is, uh, em you know, emblematic in this kind of warrior role. And I think the the warrior like clashes between these spirits. Not only does that play out, as many uh, you know ethnologists have kind of observed, a kind of Perun and Vela's type clash within the community itself. And even with like the idea that you might fight a witch or you might fight another Stuhach in a different village. And then if he dies and you win, you would go to his village and find his body. That's when, you know, where it was put um, or taken away by the other people, um, where it fell in combat in the on, on the grass and then seize his weapons of fertility, right? You know, you'd seize the ladle and the pot and the pan and the rake and take it back to you as, as essentially like a token of your victory. Uh, you've stolen the fertility from another community. You've directed the ill winds to them um, instead of to you and you protected your people but allowed another to suffer uh, that in some ways is also a memory of the clashes of these serpents in the skies so i think you know why lightning why thunder why meteorites um it's uh things that pierce uh, like the spear of Yadil or St. George, things that pierce the skies and bring this kind of immense, uh, uh, violent, almost masculine fertility to the land and that stir it up, um, is a part of the arcing in some ways of the solar flares of the, of the stars and the, our sun, especially as it hits the atmosphere and distributes. It's a, it's a memory of the way these spirits disperse their powers. And it's also a reminder of, um, the, the incredible importance that weather plays in, in fertility agrarian cycles. And I, I try to bring it back to agrarian cycles a lot just because um, I, I, most, like I would say 99% of the lore that I've learned that isn't from books uh, has, has always come from people in farming communities. And so the language that they use with me when they explain, you know, I want to ask all these occult questions of like, why this spirit? Why that spirit? You know, can I interview you for this? Can I write about this? And they're like, okay, great. But, you know, my concerns are... Um, what will I do when the heat of July and August comes? You know, what will mm -hmm. I do when there's a drought? What will I do when there's so much hail? And they will look to stars to explain those things, and they will petition uh, these ritual specialists in their communities, these sorcerers, um, which they sometimes refer to as their as their village shaman or their village, uh, you know, intermediary, um, to do something about it. And it is a taxing role. This is not somebody who you know has a journeying experience uh, to to kind of like negotiate something. the The risk of leaving your body always comes with death. You may never return to it. Um, if someone repositions your body upside down, that's a really easy way to kill a witch if you know who she is. It's just why she's leaving it her body in the form of moths and chickens and butterflies and serpents to to haunt people. Just turn her upside down, like, and then when her butterfly form comes back and is unable to land on her, you capture that and you throw her in a fire, and then she's done. She doesn't wake up. Um, same thing. There's a there's a actually a story that comes directly out of um, my hometown. And that's basically like a, 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 a dragon man was fighting the clouds and fighting the weather. And as he comes, you know, he asked his friend to watch over his body and he's tossing and turning and moaning and everything. He's in a trance and bruises are forming on him and his friend is getting worried and he's, you know, scything uh, with a sickle or the scythe, you know, the air around him. And then he sees a lizard trying to climb on his friend's body and he'll be cuts it with a scythe, he like splits it in two. And our friend, you know, our protagonist wakes up screaming and you see that he's missing his pinky finger. And he was like, what did you do that for? That was me. I was, I was, I was trying to come back, you know? Uh, so that, I think that the moral of that story is tell your friend what animal spirit forms you take when you leave your body so they don't absolutely uh, mess up like that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be throwing but, you know, butterflies or moths in the fire, y'all. All right. You better not mm -hmm. be doing that. <laughs> yeah and it's it, bad luck befalls some of these villages right uh, especially in which is my bride or as duhach lives absolutely they're going to be the one blamed uh for this uh failure on their behalf to perform it is a tremendous toll on the body to do this for this duhach who's typically a male um figure or the oblachar um it is seen as a, a warrior initiation essentially deeply linked to the mysteries of stribog who is also a weather um and wind deity a pre a pre christian slavic god whose main two saint expressions um is uh stefan vitroviti which is literally stephen the windy saint stephen the windy he's stephen the first martyr or the proto martyr um and and his uh and his other uh manifestation is uh, Bartolomeo, you know um Bartolome, uh, Bartholomew, who uh, embodies the serpentine and the dragon aspects, because of course Bartholomew was skinned, right? So any saint that is skinned alive or is uh, 
uh, defleshed is somebody who is going to be linked to serpents because of the shedding of the skin. And um, it's these people, you know, who in some ways have this uh, tremendous capacity to do this, but they also risk their lives doing it. And if they don't work, if, if they are felled in battle, if they become too sick to do it, it's said that the other spirits won. Whereas the the Zmai wife, you know, the 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 woman who's married to these the Zmai, it's her husband who will do this for her. But if it's not working, uh, there's such a great story about this that I love citing. Um, there's one I think this goes to the 30s where this one Zmai bride, uh, she was having very loud sex with her husband, and people would peep into the window of her home and they would see her with her legs up, but they wouldn't see anything between them because he doesn't show his spirit form to anybody but her, right? So they're not going to be able to perceive him. Uh, it's certainly not his human form, which is going to start to be his true form. Um, uh, where he's like a handsome, you know, uh, uh, you know, stud of a man, as it were, who's just going to town on her, and and they were like, we're sick of this. She's obviously not doing her job. She's not asking him to do his job. He's distracted. So they gather around the, the, the most of the village community gathers on her house and bangs pots and pans, uh, which is utterly cock blocking uh, this happy couple until Aww. finally the, the passionate lovemaking ceases, and uh, and you know he she basically has to be like, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, please quickly, you know, disperse the hail and fight these spirits and eat them and swallow them and then come back to my chimney and we can continue we can continue where we <laughs> left off. <laughs> Thank you so so much for coming on and and dropping so so much great lore and and sharing uh, so many wonderfully beautiful little nuggets with us and and i'm just so appreciative of uh your your vast vast wealth of of knowledge and and wisdom cat um where can people find you what are you up to what kinds of things are coming up for you anything you want to plug now is uh now is your chance I... <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I was just talking about bringing back to the home because I have this whole thing about the home and each part of the home being an organ in the body and, and mm. the, the microcosm of the stars and the constellations all existing within the house and that which window calling, and which wall yeah. and which, which thing, yeah, is is its own thing. And and I'm like, oh, where where people find me? Uh oh goodness. So I um <laughs> where's my home? I'm I'm kind of uh, <laughs> notoriously uh kind of evasive about it. And not in the sense of like, I don't want to be found, but more in the sense of like, I haven't finished my website yet. So I'm working on one um, that will hopefully be out soon, katharinapevich.com. I will be tracking my academic progress. Um, I'm available in academia.edu slash Katharina um, you know, in terms of my, my University of Toronto profile. Uh, I, you can always reach me uh, on Instagram, Samayarina, which is, yes, that is a pun, because my nickname as a kid was Kayo's Mayo, which is like a cat, the dragon, um, and which just because I was precocious and not because of this interest, this, this developed much later. Uh -huh. Uh, so I, I didn't I didn't I didn't really have faith that people could pronounce it. So I changed it in like the kind of to echo that childhood nickname uh, is Mayarina, like is a Katarina, but this is my in the front. Um, you can find me on Instagram. Um, and also I'm um, working on a few different books. Uh, I will definitely make some announcements once the website goes live. But until then, you can find me at academia.edu. And I'm gonna actually update my profile very soon. <laughs> it's one of those things. I I think your your encouragement to plug, uh, you know, all the cool projects that I'm working on, some translation efforts from Serbian to English, um, ethnographies. I'm I'm working on some annotated bibliographies and my publications and and journal articles. Uh, I think it's 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 a welcome encouragement for me because now I'm like, well, I better I better set that up, shouldn't I? Uh, I've just been so busy writing mm -hmm. that I forget to actually have an mm -hmm. online presence. But yeah, certainly you can find me those places. And if you have any questions, uh, bevichkata at gmail.com. That's my my surname, P-E-J-O-V-I-C-K-A-T-A -A, at gmail.com is a great way to reach me if you want to ask questions about this. Uh, anything that I mentioned, if you are a South Slavic language speaker of any of these particular Balkan countries and you would like resources or things or books to check out or recommendations, I can send you bibliographies in different languages if this is something that you're interested in. Um, uh, also, if you're a German or French speaker, I have plenty in those languages as well. So um, definitely I, I will I will get to work more on, on uh, my, my online presence, but uh, you can also find a lot of my classes that I've done on the more folk magical um, academic kind of adjacent bend at the Salem Witchcraft and Folklore Festival. I recently presented at the Virgis Genie Symposium, hosted by the wonderful, uh, illustrious Marcus McCoy and Karamara Rosarium uh, in uh, Olympia, Washington. 
and I presented for the Magical Women's Conference as well. Uh, and this is like in the occult sphere, as it were. Uh, I've been to plenty of academic conferences at various universities, but these are the places where there may be, you know, uh, wor workshops or classes that I've done that you can download and, and have a look at. There's there's one that's available um, all in the post kind of Salem Witchcraft and Folklore Festival uh, period for, for download from the archives if you're interested on spirit marriages, which includes a lot of dragon folklore and specifically looking at the erotic marriage components that I was talking about and one on these Duhachi and the um, the weather sorcerers called the Warriors of St. Elijah from from the previous year, if you're interested. Um, so yeah, plenty there's of plenty also of classes a, there. There's a, and, a, Hadi a Hadian pamphlet mm -hmm. on Zmai as well. Yes. Yes. And I'm working, there's a Hadian pamphlet. If you want to kind of get a bit more about this, I'm working on a bunch of others. And I'm currently working on a book on some St. Cyprian Justina uh, Orthodox uh, feast day lore, and I'm working on a book on the holy trees, the Zapis, the inscription, or the record as it's sometimes translated into English, um, and various uh, tree lore, which of course intersects with stars in the uh, Serbian Orthodox context. So uh, hopefully uh, that will be coming around somewhere in the coming year or two. Uh, so yeah, lots to do, a PhD to finish, mm -hmm. uh, but thank you so much for having me on. I deeply appreciate you. I absolutely love this podcast. So it's a true blessing to be able to nerd out with you here. And uh, I'm really uh, excited to uh, keep listening uh, to all the wonderful guests that you bring on. So thank you absolutely. for letting me be part of that. Thank you again. Hope to have you back on again at some point as well, Kat. Thank you so much.